Hello uh, and welcome to this virtual um, Getty Villa um, and today's lecture. I'm uh, Tim Potts, the Maria Hammer Tuttle and Robert Tuttle Director of the J. Paul Getty Museum. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to us today. We have um, a, a wonderful lecture in store for you on early Mesopotamia. And the background to the exhibit to the lecture is, of course, the exhibition that we currently have at the Getty Villa. Um, there is a backstory to it. The exhibition was scheduled to open in March of 2020. And just uh, two days or three days before the exhibition was due to open, we all had to close the museum because of COVID. So it was never, the opening never took place. Um, and, uh, but through um, the generosity and um, collaboration of the Louvre, where the works of art um, belong, we were able to extend their stay here in California in the hope that we would be able to open when COVID, the COVID situation improved, as it eventually did. And therefore, we were able to open a couple of months ago, and the exhibition is now up and running and has been seen by many, many people. And I hope um, many of you on the screen today will be able to attend. Um, the subject of the exhibition is, of course, ancient Mesopotamia, which has a very special place in the sort of story of human history as the first um, fully, as it were, rounded civilization that we know of, um, the earliest writing, the origin of the very first cities with monumental architecture, huge city walls, temples, administrative buildings, a very structured society, many specializations in technology, agriculture, engineering, and such like. Also very sophisticated in its science, mathematics, and so on. So many uh, extraordinary achievements of a culture that um, really begins in the full blown form that I'm, we're talking about around the middle of the fourth millennium BC, let's say 3,400 BC, and survives and flourishes even for three and a half thousand years until the last cuneiform text that we know of, cuneiform being the writing system of ancient Mesopotamia, the last dated tablet is around 70 AD. So that period of the culture and the civilization is an extraordinarily long and rich and important one. Um, the collection that you see in the exhibition has come almost entirely from the Musée du Louvre in Paris. And through their extraordinary generosity, we have many of the greatest masterpieces of ancient Mesopotamian culture and art on display here at the Getty Villa. Uh, so this is a really um, extraordinary act of generosity on their part. And it's a wonderful opportunity for both the local community here in Los Angeles, Southern California, and the United States generally to see these great masterpieces and to uh, understand something of the importance of this culture, um, both for, in a sense, its intrinsic interest, but also for the influence it had on other cultures, including, of course, that of the classical world, Greece and Rome. In the wake of Alexander the Great's conquest, there was this very interesting and important coming together of these two cultures. And the Greeks, in fact, learned a lot of their astronomy, mathematics, and so on from the Babylonians. Um, as well as the exhibition, there is, of course, a catalog um, to the exhibition, which I hope many of you will want to have. Um, and that's been co-edited by Ariane Thomas and myself, uh, as has, and the exhibition likewise has been co-curated um, by us, but of course, is uh, based on the collection that Ariane Thomas herself uh, oversees at the Louvre. Um, so without much further ado, um, I would like to introduce uh, her to you and just give you a, a short version of her many achievements. She is the head of department, the senior curator of um, Oriental Antiquities or Near Eastern Art, as we would call it, the Near East representing, as it were, the modern Middle East. Um, so she's the head of the uh, Near Eastern collection at the Musée du Louvre and is a specialist herself in ancient Mesopotamia. She took her doctorate at the Sorbonne in Paris so, um, and has been responsible uh, since then for many research projects, exhibitions, both in France and elsewhere, uh, and many other and excavations also in the Near East in Mesopotamia and elsewhere. 
And she's also directs the Louvre's current project of restoration at the museum in Mosul in northern Iraq, Mosul being the city right next to the ancient Assyrian capital of Nineveh, which you'll hear about in the exhibition. So we're delighted to have her with us today, and she will be providing, um, I'm sure, an extraordinary overview in her lecture of the some of the material in the exhibition and the themes that are highlighted in the exhibition. And I do encourage you to stay on after the lecture because we will be having um, a question and answer session. So without further ado, it's a great pleasure to welcome Ariane Thomas to present her lecture on ancient Mesopotamia. Hello, um, I'm Ariane Thomas and I speak to you from the Louvre, the Kursabad Court. And uh, it is a very special uh, occasion, I never did it to be honest, uh, a lecture that I was supposed to give in LA last March in 2020, uh, by mid-March, when we were supposed also to open the exhibition so-called uh, Mesopotamia Civilization Begins at the Getty Villa. And uh, unfortunately, the official opening date being March 18th, uh, we couldn't open. Thus, we tried to find uh, another way to, to talk to you uh, about this exhibition. And, and hopefully, uh, we will just discover a bit more about uh, ancient Mesopotamia through this, uh, this show that is currently at the Getty Villa. So as a start, um, I presented an image that is among the other treasures of the engineering department in the Louvre. Of course, we do have an extraordinary collection and many masterpieces are now in Los Angeles, but we also do have a treasure of archives and especially photographic archives, uh, among which we do have some of the oldest archaeological photographs because uh, everything started with the excavations of Korsabad in the 1840s and uh, as early as in the 1850s, the second uh, responsible of the excavations of Korsabad, a French consul called Victor Place, brought with him uh, someone who knew at that time to make photos while it was just invented. And so I have this image that is uh, an image from the past showing the Tigris and the way on the Kelek, uh, those very first uh, archaeologists could bring the pieces that are behind me from Mosul and Korsabad, the region of Nineveh in the north of Iraq, to Paris here in the Louvre. Uh, we will now look at this map uh, that was prepared by, by our teams. Mesopotamia being this land between the two rivers after its Greek name, which just means that. Uh, Mesopotamia is more or less modern Iraq. So that's what you see uh, on the map. And uh, this is, let's say, the geographical uh, definition of the topic of the exhibition. Uh, but then we also do have a chronological trail that is uh, following, let's say, 3,000 years of history from the very beginning of what we officially call history, which means we do have written sources, and that happened in the uh, late 4th millennium BC when writing was invented. The first writing known today is cuneiform writing, found in southern Mesopotamia, and more or less at the same time also in Iran and in Egypt with different autonomous systems. And from the, let's say, late 4th, early 3rd millennium to the 1st millennium BC, you have those 3,000 years of history that we do present on a thematical way uh, inside the uh, Getty Villa. Mesopotamia knew a lot, lots of ruptures and changes, political changes, populations, migrations, many changes. 
but that at the same time it also uh, especially in the official courts considered that uh, there was a continuity in this history so tablets were copied uh, years after years and century after century as well as monuments were built and rebuilt century after century. The first space you could enter when hopefully you will visit it is devoted to the cities uh, and it is called First Cities uh, with a quote, a quote from Gilgamesh, a very famous legendary king of Uruk in the south of Mesopotamia, uh, telling about his great uh, work especially uh, to build walls for his city of Uruk. And uh, in this space, we do start uh, presenting how it did start, because what must be highlighted is that uh, the first cities we do know uh, up to today were built and were discovered in Mesopotamia. That's why we do consider that it was a urban world and that the very first cities are Uruk and those other cities. You see here uh, some of the remains of those very first cities that appeared in the fourth millennium in South Mesopotamia and especially here from Uruk with some of the decorations of the walls and you had those cones with different colors that you could insert in the walls made out of clay and thus, as you can see uh, from the image on the top uh, left, uh, you could have a uh, a mosaic effect on large, large part of the walls, and that was quite magnificent. I also show you here uh, something that you can see at the villa, which is a, um, a vase very typical from the Uruk period, this uh, period in which cities appeared, which shows that it was uh, a accompanied by the, uh, let's say, specialization of the people living in the city. And that's probably the best definition of a city, which means that more or less it could also be even smaller than a village. But in a city, we do have people specialized. You do have an administration, you do have craftsmen, you do have a priest and, 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 and of course, kings and, and, and uh, workers and things people who are not uh, only working uh, in uh, agriculture, for example, as it was the case, and it is still the case in many, in many villages. So more or less, city is uh, a trade center, more or less, where people do specialize. Cities are obviously a human creation and uh, we had to recall here also that in the Mesopotamian belief, humans were created by gods and they were created by gods to serve them. So that is uh, this uh, slide that I present where you can see a, a very famous tablet telling about the creation of man by the gods uh, when they well, more or less think that they, they are tired to work and it's so hard that they want to find an other solution and the solution will be to create human being so that they work for the gods and they serve the daily meals and they do everything that might be pleasant to the gods. Still, the first humanity being quite, uh, let's say, well, making too much sound, uh, gods will uh, decide to destroy it so that silent will be again uh, a peaceful one but uh, Enki the god who really created the human being will decide to save the wisest of the men and it will be more or less like Zen in the Bible the story of the flood because gods will send to the humanity a, a, a terrible flood to destroy everything with water and Enki the god will just warn before this very wise man who will become immortal and who will save humanity uh, and also uh, various sort of animals with him. 
In this urban world, there is an infinity of gods. And there's also a hierarchy of gods uh, with specialties, all of them having their residence in the cities, in the temples built and rebuilt by the men. Uh, and here I show you again the map because I think this is an important idea to recall that for Mesopotamians there is uh, an idea that urban world is the, civiliz the civilized world and it goes with the title of the exhibition while you do have chaos and you have to fight this chaos. That's more or less what you can let's say symbolically see on this uh, little piece that is, that is in the exhibition and where you see uh, a fight between a bull and a lion. I also show you a very famous stella brought from Paris to, to Malibu uh, where you can see a human uh, a king serving the gods uh, to, re to recall that they were adoring, uh, adoring uh, the gods uh, through those offerings. And uh, among those offerings, uh, they could be done through precious vessels, uh, including this exceptional uh, vase in silver uh, dedicated by Enmetena to the god Ningirsu for its daily meal. Inside the temple, uh, we can find some, sometimes when we are lucky, those, uh, that sort of very precious uh, vessel, but more often it has completely disappeared. And to be honest, Mesopotamian archaeology is quite hard because very often even the temple itself disappeared because it was made out of clay. And clay architecture being extremely fragile, it had to be rebuilt and rebuilt, and if not, it just smells. And that's what you can see here. This is uh, a picture I made myself in Our, um, and you can see how the clay architecture is easily uh, destroyed and very difficult to recognize. Knowing this, Mesopotamian kings uh, used to uh, deposit some uh, foundations uh, deposits made out of stone, made out of metal that was, uh, you know, they knew that this would last more than clay. And this is what you can see here with a foundation deposit uh, from Lagash in the end of the third millennium that is uh, presented uh, at the Getty with this uh, foundation figure in made out of metal uh, along with the uh, cuneiform tablet uh, in stone. Clay architecture at the time of its splendor could be very monumental and spectacular and that's what the Bible still recalls, uh, telling for instance that in Nineveh you, you would need three days to cross it. Um, and this might be better evoked through the 3D reconstruction, such as the one I, I show here, which is a 3D reconstruction we do uh, at the Louvre uh, for Corsabad. So this can give you can give you an idea of how it did look uh, when uh, when it did exist at the time of Sargon II in the uh, late eighth uh, century um, before Christ. Of course, we couldn't bring Korsabad to Malibu, so we did bring only a very, well, tiny fragment compared to Zeus, but very monumental. Uh, it is the head of a lamassu, of a bull uh, with a human head um, and uh, wings also. Uh, so those guards that were protecting the entrances of the city and the main gates in the palace of Sargon II and many Assyrian cities the same way. So we couldn't bring it, it's too uh, monumental, but you can at, in Malibu see at least a head of a, of a guard, of such a guard, and uh, to be honest it was already quite an advantage venture to bring it because it is extremely heavy, heavy even uh, on Lizzie Head. 
Another monumental piece that we owe to the generosity of the Metropolitan Museum in New York is a glazed brick panel from Babylon that not only gives you another idea of the monumentality of the ancient Mesopotamian architecture, but also recalls that it was very colorful and really splendid. So this uh, panel uh, shows a lion, a lion of the goddess Ishtar, and it did belong to this uh, beautiful city, if we do follow Herodotus, it was the most beautiful city in the ancient world, some that nothing could be compared to. This panel was among uh, 120 lions that, you, that would follow you on the main road in Babylon, the processional way uh, that did cross the very famous gate of Ishtar that is partly reconstructed in uh, Berlin. Here I just show you the room that is devoted to this uh, theme, ancient city, before focusing on another theme that is ancient writing. Here I show you one of the oldest tablets, the oldest cuneiform tablet, dated back, dating back to the uh, end of the fourth millennium. And this uh, ancestor of writing is telling you a bit about exchanges between Uruk and the Gulf. I can just tell you that in the exhibition, along with many explanations on the cuneiform script and its evolution, you could also experiment what was uh, central for the ancient Mesopotamian writing, meaning it was orally transmitted. Uh, many of the texts, uh, Gilgamesh epic and others, were told orally, and that's why uh, we did uh, insert an experiment made with Cambridge uh, where you can listen to somebody reading, telling out loud uh, an extract of the epic of Gilgamesh so that it can give you an idea how it did sound uh, to listen to uh, this, uh, this ancient language. Gilgamesh ana shashuma e zakara ana utana pishtim ruki ana tana kuma utana pishti minatu ka ulshana ki yati ama ata uata ulshana ta ki yati ma ata gomor ka libi ana e pishtu konti ahinadat eluzerika Ata ki ki tazizma in a puhur ili balata teshu. We also had a very important loan from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and it is here, the Caillou Michaud, just to recall that. Uh, 170 years ago, when it all started, we did know nothing about ancient Mesopotamia and we were totally unable to understand the cuneiform script. So, for instance, this caillou that is more or less, a, let's say, a gift, uh, an exemption of taxes uh, from a king to a member of his family. Uh, and we had the most uh, funny uh, tr translations because nobody could answer it. And this is thanks to the first excavations that quite quickly in the 19th century we finally deciphered the cuneiform script and first the Assyrian language. Let's say also Akkadian. Along with the question of writing, we do evoke also the economy of ancient Mesopotamia that was notably based on agriculture and husbandry, as you can see on those, uh, on those pieces, but also on exchanges. Mesopotamia is more or less at the center of what we call the Middle East, and so it was really crossed by exchanges and influences through the land, through the rivers, of course, and through the, the, the sea, especially uh, the Gulf. Writing is also evoked through the diversity of the cuneiform text, so we can find, and here you see some uh, examples, maps, we can find models, we can find exercises, we can find contracts, uh, laws, we have administrative documents, many, and we also do have for instance here, mathematical prism uh, that could be uh, used uh, even today uh, for uh, exercising uh, students. 
Let's also recall the importance of astrology and astronomy as it was the basis uh, for our modern knowledge. And I will recall with this uh, image that ancient Mesopotamians did recognize many planets and did organize through their accurate observation over centuries, they did organize time just as we still use it. So the calendar, and here you do have a calendar with the 12 months, the fact that one hour has 60 minutes, all of this comes from ancient Mesopotamian. Also, they did have uh, the most, well, the oldest libraries we know, and all of this knowledge was partly done, conserved uh, in those very famous libraries. Uh, among the most famous ones, uh, there is the Ashurbanipal, uh, an Assyrian king uh, library, that was uh, located in Nineveh. And uh, here in Malibu, you can see uh, um, a tablet that was uh, that belonged to this very famous uh, library uh, of Ashurbanipal in the sixth uh, century, and as before, I show you also the room devoted to writing. This room is quickly followed by a corridor devoted to cylinder seals, and this is a very uh, great space to discover this other treasure of ancient Mesopotamian materials with many stones, many colors, and wonderful sculptures in miniature. Uh, so you do have those uh, precious objects that were used as a signature to seal a letter, a vase, a door, anything. And we can show you here a vase that was sealed with uh, clay and the imprint of a seal on it but it was also worn for protection. The last room is devoted to the kings. I will just recall that the very first kings, and this is the title of this, uh, of this space, the first kings are obviously known in Mesopotamia since writing gives us the very first name uh, of those historic kings. I will present you here an image that may sound familiar to you since uh, this was also the main image selected for the show. This image that you may have seen in the streets in LA uh, shows you Gudea, a very famous prince, uh, a Neo-Sumerian prince in the 22nd century before Christ. And here you can see him really between humans and gods because he well, he's the king, he's a human being, and he's also, you know, holding the vase with the, the water uh, emerging from it. And inside the water, you can also see fishes. This is a sign that water brings fertility. And ho so he's clearly, you know, between human and God, the first mandatory of God, and bringing fertility thanks to the support of the gods to his kingdom. So he's really the representative for both sides. He's also a clear image of the, uh, let's say, uh, king in king praying, king devoting, uh, the, the devout king to the, to the gods. Another stela is showing you another main function that was devoted to the kings and any Mesopotamian kings, one reigning over a small kingdom or one in the first millennium over a very large empire, they would share the same functions. And uh, apart from uh, being the, the first praying one uh, to the god, uh, he, he should also be a warrior king. And here you have a very, very uh, thin and wonderfully uh, carved uh, stela uh, of victory from an Akkadian king. I also show you an image uh, showing a king uh, making this, and he's in fact uh, having a basket of bricks on his head. This is another function, this is the builder king, the builder and rebuilder king. So he has his basket of bricks ready to build uh, or rebuild what's necessary 
temples, palaces, walls, or anything else that is necessary to uh, the prosperity of the kingdom. The other image is showing you a piece that couldn't travel to LA. This is the very famous Codex of Hammurabi, telling you about the function of the king as a king of justice. Uh, and we were uh, happy to bring part of the code of Hammurabi to LA with uh, fragments from another stella, as we know that Hammurabi did spread his code over the kingdom, and so we do have those fragments from another stella, less conserved, but th this way it could travel to LA. Uh, but before leaving the kings, I must also remember that they, uh, this uh, power, this royal power, was uh, transferred within a dynasty and especially from father to son, even though it was, of course, uh, very often more complicated. Let's not forget also the other people around the king and notably the women. And here I wanted also to highlight that we brought to you a very beautiful statue showing a priestess that can uh, give you also an idea of how an Hedwana would look like as uh, we also wanted to, to, to tell you about this very famous lady that was a daughter of a king, an Akkadian king, a priestess in a temple, in a main temple, and the very first known author in history. She wrote many poems, many beautiful ones that you see on the screen. Not only daughter of kings, I also highlighted the wife, mother, grandmother of kings with this very famous uh, uh, metallic piece uh, showing Nakia uh, along with her son Asaradon and Nakia for many was uh, a figure that might have inspired the legendary queen Semiramis as she was among the very rare known in history women for having a political uh, power. Among the very, very last image, this is the peristyle, and we used it as a timeline. And along this timeline, this, those 3,000 years of history, we exhibited a few, let's say, main and magnificent royal heads, telling you about some of the main kings in Mesopotamian history from the Sumerian period in the third millennium to the first millennium. And indeed, we do finish with a king that was not so much Mesopotamian as it is the head of Alexander the Great. And that is, of course, fitting better with the other Greco-Roman heads that are presenting along the peristyle at the Getty Villa. But it also tells you that that was a very important episode in Mesopotamian history since uh, in the 4th century BC, the conquest of Alexander the Great, who admired a lot Mesopotamia and did die in Babylon, willing to make a capital of it, uh, was also, uh, let's say, the beginning of the end and uh, the beginning of the end of this very old uh, civilization as it was more and more Hellenized, more and more diverse. And even though we kept memory of it up to date, and then we rediscovered this history through the archaeology, that was uh, the end and the start of, uh, let's say, yeah, a dynamic of forgetting Mesopotamia before rediscovering it uh, 2,000 years later. So I hope this could uh, give you the will to go to the Getty Villa as soon as possible. And as soon as possible too, you're of course very welcome uh, in the Louvre. Ariane, welcome back. Thank you very <laughs> much for a wonderful lecture, which covered a lot of territory. And we do have, therefore, quite a few questions. The first one is asking with, when we say the oldest civilization, the first writing and so on, does that mean first in the Western world or are we talking globally? Would you like to start off on that? <laughs> 
Well, I think we can answer both. Uh, this is probably the thing that I, I think, and perhaps we share that, uh, is quite fascinating in our field, uh, which is that it is always up to date and uh, we don't know what we will know tomorrow. So, of course, uh, and so far, this is among the oldest achievements that we do know, and this is exactly why we want and it is essential to continue to work over there in the field and to protect those fields that are uh, extremely uh, threatened currently to make sure that we do, didn't skip something essential that we can find on the field. So, so far, zoos are among the oldest and perhaps we will discover something again. Uh, in the late 19th century, when some French uh, did excavate at Telo, they had kind of a vertigo discovering that uh, the history they sought was so much older than they previously thought they would find. And they, they, they found millennia that they wouldn't have guessed, thanks to their archaeological work. Yeah. And that leads into another question, which maybe I can begin to answer, which is about the um, Mesopotamian writing versus Egyptian. And is it is it true that Mesopotamian is earlier? Um, but it seems at this point, again, we don't know what we will discover, as Arian has said, next year or a decade from now, but the earliest texts from uh, Mesopotamia date to about 3400 BC, level 4a at Uruk, uh, and they were refused, they were being reused and buried, so they are actually older than that, but we don't know how much older. The earliest texts in Egypt that seem to be genuine writing of course, earlier there are pot marks and various other things that are leading towards writing, but not quite writing. And the earliest that seems to be generally accepted is a is in a, a burial called Tomb UJ at Abydos, one of the Dynasty Zero kings. Um, so just before the first dynasty. Um, and that seems to be perhaps a little bit later, but only by a century or two. So in this context of thousands of years, a century or two is not very much. And um, we have to keep an open mind about what might be found in Egypt that might push it back earlier. One last thing I'd say, though, that this is a period at the end in the late fourth millennium where you do find in Egypt a number of motifs and uh, styles of architecture that seem to come from Mesopotamia and even Elam to slightly to the east of Mesopotamia. So there does seem to be some contact and influence from Mesopotamia to Egypt around this same time. Whether writing was in some way part of that influence, we don't know. In fact, the Egyptologists are pretty clear that no, it wasn't influence from Mesopotamia. It was an indigenous uh, process of creation and the writing system itself is certainly very different. Um, so that's where we are today. Who knows where we will be uh, tomorrow? Can I move on, though? Unless, Larian, do you want to add anything to that before we? No, you 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 made it very clear. Perhaps, as you mentioned, Elam, and this will bring our audience further east. But indeed, you also do know about the proto elamite uh, uh, writings that we don't understand so well now. But uh, so it seems that perhaps due to these exchanges, uh, it makes uh, the various cultures more innovative. And probably in this context, they do invent autonomous system in terms of linguistic uh, to write, which is completely new. And apparently so far, this first appeared in Uruk, which clearly, as you said, had a uh, roads of trade uh, towards the east and the west. Yeah, exactly. Um, there were a cluster of questions about Babylon, the city of Babylon. We're going to jump around a bit, but I'm trying to answer a few questions in and put them together. One was about uh, how large it was, both in terms of population and area. I seem to remember that the walls of Babylon are some six or eight, maybe six or eight miles long. Herodotus talks about how long they are and how wide they are and having, you can have two chariots on the walls of Babylon. It was the most spectacular and largest city of its day. And again, but I'm deep reaching into old memory here. I think the speculation on population, and we don't have, of course, real numbers because they didn't do censuses, or if they did do a census, they didn't record them. 
But so all we have to go on are the, the areas of housing and so on, and we have to make estimates for how many people would have lived in uh, these sorts of houses. Uh, I think the estimates have been well over 100,000, even close to 200,000 people, something in that range. So it was the most major city of its day, of course, far eclipsed later by Rome uh, and maybe even Alexandria. But in the 6th century BC, which is when Babylon was at its height, uh, it was something like that. Um, do you want to, again, would you like to? No. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Well, let me put the next question to you. Um, you mentioned the Lamassu as representing a god, the god Lamassu. The question was, what gods does it represent? So I think there's a little confusion here about whether the Lamassu is a god, uh, a genie, etc. But you could perhaps uh, clarify that. So let's say it's a divine creature uh, that is uh, that is good. Uh, so you need her, its protection, and uh, we 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 see it uh, since the third millennium as a protective creature that has the strength of a bull, uh, the face of a human being, and also the powers of a bird uh, with the wings. So we we do see it in the in the iconography uh, for three millennia and it is only in the first millennium that it becomes so monumental uh, as you did see uh, on the course about the uh, monumental Lamassu uh, so these uh, winged uh, bull-headed uh, creatures that did protect uh, the main passage in Korsabad and in many other Assyrian cities. So I don't know if that does answer but the, the, the Pantheon uh, is quite complex and, and, and very populated if we can say so uh, in ancient Mesh Mesopotamia with a hierarchy with main gods and, and also then uh, uh, gods uh, who have a uh, little less power and also those creatures uh, among which those uh, Lamassu. I don't know if that is uh, enough clear and if you if you want to add something uh, Tim. Yeah no I think that I think you've covered it well. I'll ask you another question put, combining another couple of questions. One is about women, women writers, and of course there's an Enhedwana which you mentioned. And another question was about if there was this oral tradition of delivering orally, why was there the need to write them down also on clay? Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to answer or...? Uh... Why don't you start? Okay, I, I can stop. So why? Actually, this is the main question we, we, we do ask, of course, because we have this uh, treasures of a, a million uh, tablets, a million cuneiform text, which is really huge compared to the other ancient text uh, in antiquities, in antiquity. But still, uh, what do we have and, and what was exactly noted? If I can take an example, we do have so many contracts that are extremely important to to know better about uh, about this aspect of life that is still very important uh, in our modern life. Still, we know that many contracts, if not much of them, uh, that we have are in the cases that were complicated. The other, let's say, wedding contracts, for instance, were not written, so apparently. So that is really uh, a question that we have uh, to take into account, that what was written was not necessarily always what did can't. Uh, I mean, many of the things that were working well might have not been written or might have been written later for memory. So I don't know if it is not maybe too complex, but um, so to answer, uh, there is a parallel life, let's say, between the oral culture and the written culture especially for anything that has to do with daily life. It is probably a little more, more simpler when, when you go into the literature and religious texts, because of course here you have a tradition of writing in temples. And, and so again, uh, to answer, I think that some things were written for very practical reasons, other because it was in the traditions of the temple to copy the text. And then for the rest, we, we also do wonder what has not been written. 
that was the first part of the question. If you want to add something, Tim. Um, I think I will leave it because we have so many other questions. Okay, okay. So I, I'm, so, maybe do you want to answer about women? <laughs> well, we just to reinforce what you said that we the as it happens the earliest author that we know of in any culture so far is a woman. She was the daughter of the king of Akkad named Sargon, and he appointed her as the priestess of the moon god at the city of Ur. So this is the 24th century BC, and she is credited with having written a number of um, hymns and other uh, literary uh, compositions, uh, which are mostly about the gods and the things that you would write about as a priestess in Ur. Uh, and, and the tradition uh, treated her as a very eminent and perhaps even semi-divine character in the tradition of Mesopotamian literature. And so she is this um, extraordinary figure. Um, and we have a number of these compositions, some of them in the exhibition, not from the 24th century BC when she lived, but as Ariane was saying, these things were copied and copied and copied over the centuries. So we mostly have examples from the early second millennium BC, um, but these things are preserved and her name, uh, her name is ascribed to their creation. Um, staying with writing, we've got a couple of questions about how it was deciphered and whether Assyrians and Babylonians would have been able to understand and read Egyptian writing and would Egyptians have been able to uh, read Assyrian and Babylonian. The average Egyptian and Babylonian would not have read Egyptian or vice versa. However, we do know the kings, particularly in the late Bronze Age, let's say from 1500 BC to 1000 BC, a period of much international uh, trade, contact, uh, conquests and other things. So, but a lot of uh, diplomatic, let's shall we say, um, activity and there was a constant flow of letters between the kings and the princes of Babylonia with the Egypt, specifically with the Egyptians, but also with peoples in Syria, in modern Turkey, uh, right down the Levant um, in Lebanon and, 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 and current Israel. So there were certainly scribes trained bilingually to read Syrian Babylonian. They are just dialects of the same language and Egyptian, but they would have had to be trained specially in these other languages. And we do have some cases where we know they were even trilingual or multilingual. So this was a profession. The scribe was something, you know, they were essential to the operations of all of these cultures. And their training was a very rigorous and, um, you know, very uh, basically a lifetime of learning. The other part of the question was about the decipherment of how did we learn to read cuneiform writing? Uh, I'll give the very short answer, which is was it was based on an inscription that the Persians in the late sixth century, the King Darius created at a site called Behistun in Western Iran, and a bit like Champollion deciphering um, uh, the uh, Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs because he had a Greek version, the Persians also did this text in three languages, in Elamite, the native cuneiform language of Elam in Babylonian and in Old Persian. And because Old Persian is a known, as it were, language, it could be um, the first to be deciphered. Then it was recognized that um, Babylonian was a Semitic language, connections with names from Herodotus and other things. It was a very high intellectual achievement. But in the middle of the 19th century, over a period of a couple of decades, um, some really brilliant people, Rawlinson, Hinks, Opair, and others, managed to work out that the Babylonian script was a Semitic language, therefore the basic grammar, the basic vocabulary could be um, worked out, and then uh, it went from there. And um, we now have a very good understanding, in fact, of Assyrian and Babylonian um, and through the, the periods that they were um, being used. Ariane. Would you like to? No, no, no. You, you, you did uh, sum sum up uh, this perfectly. I think we we can just have a brief thought for those who brought back uh, copies, uh, stamps, and uh, and drawings after these inscriptions, and also originals, because this is because of this amount that then those uh, wonderful scholars uh, who 
except perhaps Rollinson didn't go so much in the field, did decipher by the mid uh, 19th century the Akkadian language, uh, so-called Assyrian at that time, because they had Assyrian inscriptions. And there was a day on which they declared the decipherment because three people yes. were given the same inscription uh, in a blind copy and they all had to submit their translations to the royal Heal. government. And um, they, they, um, they read the, the translations and they were sufficiently um, uh, similar, I mean, more than similar, yeah. very close to each other. So they declared that this, if three people independently can come to the same- French and British agreed, and Irish, so it yes. was done. <laughs> It was UNESCO um, type operation. <laughs> um, the, we were asked about the large figures in the second gallery, and I'll just mention that they are um, in those very dark stones. One is an Akkadian figure, King Manish Tusu, one of the sons of Sargon, who I mentioned earlier, so as a way a sibling of in Hedwana. Um, one was a figure of Gudea seated, and we haven't talked enough about Gudea, maybe that should be next. And the other is a, an unknown ruler, uh, maybe a few centuries later of the early second millennium. But these hard, dark stones, which take a very high polish, were particularly um, uh, used by the, the Akkadians. And then in the, the re regimes in the centuries following, they, they also adopted this material uh, and uh, very widely. A question about Gudea was his hat or his bald head. And what, what is the nature of his cap? Is it a royal or, or not? Perhaps you would like to talk about that. <laughs> so it, it is royal, actually, and he kind of launches something because after him, the kings that will go after him, not only in his kingdom of Lagash, uh, in Mesopotamia for centuries, will keep this uh, habit of having such a heart with a large border. Uh, the only difference is indeed that only at the time of Gudea, you do have this cap with this curly motif uh, that according to some might have evoke some fur, but this we, we are not sure of. It's only a hypothesis. So. Another question is, the what is the current state with excavation in Iraq and also with your project in Mosul? So actually we, we were lucky enough and we had this honor to receive the uh, director of the Antiquities of Iraq uh, a few days ago, very recently here in Paris. So I, I will just quote him, allow me to quote him. Uh, so Iraq is, as you know, a country that is suffering uh, many crises, uh, sanitary as everywhere in the world, but also uh, economical, political, and of course, uh, with uh, uh, many consequences in terms of security uh, and safety uh, still, and this is really, uh, I think, uh, something we must think as something positive, very uh, bringing hope. Uh, it's a country with such a vertiginous history, uh, full of archaeological tell, uh, archaeological remains, um, and, and, and still uh, teams, Iraqi teams and foreigner teams uh, do work in Iraq. They succeed to go there. Uh, and, and the Iraqi government and especially, of course, the Directorate of Antiquity is extremely supportive of that. And we must be extremely, uh, I think, thank them for their support while it is very complicated for them to do it. Uh, so I will also quote something else that is the main issue they face, uh, which is the traffic of antiquities and the looting uh, in on sites, sites that we know, sites which we don't know yet, where nobody did work uh, so far. And that is even harder because we don't know what is on the site and what might uh, be found uh, on the site. And also, of course, uh, you, you know that the looting uh, of museums uh, for or, uh, artifacts from we know. So of course, this is just to, to make everybody sensitive to this because it's extremely difficult and only all together, of course, we can help uh, help this. So then to answer to the question about Mosul, 
uh, the Louvre, uh, together with the uh, with the Smithsonian Institution, the World Monuments Fund, and supported by uh, um, Alif, uh, is involved, highly involved, uh, along with our Iraqi colleagues, in the rehabilitation of the Mosul Museum, which uh, suffered, as probably some of you did uh, did see on screen, suffered from a, a, a very terrible. Uh, uh, destruction and looting at the same time. Uh, some videos were online by uh, ISIS uh, showing the intentional destruction of some of the uh, masterpieces of the museum. So here uh, we try to work with our Iraqi colleagues to help them because of course if it had happened to the Louvre we, we hope our colleagues would come to help us the same way. Uh, it is a complete disaster with bombing, destroying the objects, uh, the flu, the fire, they had everything almost. So we did all of what was the most uh, urgent and now we work to restore the collections and hopefully rehabilitate the whole building and museum until it's complete reopening. Thank you and uh, I'll maybe give quick questions, uh, quick answers to a um, couple of questions about one is the function of the ziggurats. These are the step towers, these massive step towers which start in the Sumerian period but continue on much later. Um, Herodotus famously describes the one in Babylon mm -hmm. and um, talks about there being a shrine at the top. Um, there certainly are these steps, these stairways that lead to the top, but none of the ziggurats are well enough pre uh, preserved to really know what was on the top, but presumably something, since there are these stairways leading to it. They were, as it were, aspects of the religious uh, architecture, often next to temples, and they certainly, being high on a temple, meant you were closer to the gods, so it's something putting you in connection with that other world. They're not burial, they're not like pyramids in, in, the, in the Americas and so on, which have burials in them, they are purely, as it were, built structures that would be a platform for um, ceremony or some um, uh, something else which would be you know, on the top. Um, the use of seals, these were essentially signatures um, there's usually an inscription which names the person and their title, uh, and then there's the iconography that goes with it, which changes throughout um, the centuries and therefore is an important, as it were, element of the art history of ancient Mesopotamia. So they were rolled onto the tablets, the clay tablets, which were uh, in cuneiform, uh, as, as it were, as, like a modern signature that we would uh, use in signing a contract, but they were also decorative and is a way of protective. They were worn. Often they have a pin through the middle of them, which could be attached to a garment. And they would, um, the iconography would, in, in some cases, be at, uh, apotropaic. It would protect you from uh, evil forces and um, beings um, that could do you harm. I think we've got one time for one only, or at the very most, um, two questions. Uh, one was about the role of animals in ancient Mesopotamia. Of course, they were an important part of um, you know, animal husbandry, um, cows, sheep, and so on. It's a very hot, desolate landscape, particularly the south. So it's not a place where you can have horses and very certain other animals. But of course, they were um, um, you know, the, the use for as a source of food and um, pastoral activity was a large part of the economy and much represented in the, particularly in the early periods, um, the Auric period of the late fourth and early third millennium BC. Um, um, perhaps the last one, I'll, uh, Ariane, for you um, about the Assyrian Empire. Um, and why did it come to dominate the ancient Near East? Were the Mesopotamian empires more violent than other empires at the time? <laughs> so, actually, uh, well, to know why uh, the Assyrian Empire did start, we can say that uh, we have a story of a, a, a little land that is the Assyrian land having no, no exit uh, no sea, uh, threatened by the mountains and the plains and the steppe. 
So more or less, they came from a defensive uh, strategy to an offensive strategy, uh, uh, um, enlarging their land to 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 threaten instead of get, getting threatened. So uh, while they were closed on their not so little, but still little uh, land of Ashur, uh, by the end of the second millennium, we see that there's a new energy and a new strategy uh, that is very military. And so they, they do attack uh, to, to enlarge the territory, which also brings them uh, wealth and, uh, and, and many, many ways to, to have more power. Uh, so they did extend, they did extend to the various uh, orientations the north, the east, the west, uh, they were extremely proud to go even to Egypt. Uh, and, and this is something uh, that we, we can see in the text and in, and, 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 and in images. So to make it brief, um, I think, yes, the, the Assyrians then were in this uh, the dynamic of an empire and they wanted to get bigger, which in a way probably uh, it explained some of the crises they had to face. Uh, some they did, uh, they did uh, solve them and, and in the end they were, uh, they were defeated by a combination of Babylonians at the south that previously they submitted and, uh, and Medians uh, from, the, from the east. So I hope this does answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, we are at 11.01, so I'm afraid I think we need to um, draw things to a close. I want to thank Ariane particularly for such a wonderful lecture and also for answering so many of your questions. Um, and uh, so there is another month with the exhibition open. Um, uh, through the middle of August. So if you haven't been to see it already, please do. Um, and hopefully this today's event has provided um, some background and a framework in which you will gain even more, hopefully, from seeing the objects um, at the villa. So again, yeah. thank you very and much. get rid of the prejudices, because in a way, the violence of Assyrian is kind of a prejudice that we got from the Bible and the Greek houses. So probably thanks to the Getty, because we also may, um, shall thank the Getty for welcoming this exhibition. That is indeed the first occasion to, to show this civilization in such a large way uh, in California. And you can uh, go through uh, what you may have heard about Mesopotamia to have direct a direct relation to those objects. Indeed. Well said. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariane. Thank you to all of you. And we look forward to seeing you hopefully at the museum very soon. Goodbye. <laughs>